Hello, and welcome to Small Business Digest Radio. My name is Don Mazzella, and I am your host for a program devoted to identifying strategies and suggestions to help small business managers increase profits, add sales, better manage cash flow, improve employee management, and streamline operations. Our guests are other entrepreneurs and experts offering their solutions to the problems and opportunities facing small business leaders. Our aim in each program is to provide one or two thought-provoking ideas or suggestions. So follow us on Twitter at hashtag 2SBDigest or at our website at www.smallbusinessdigest.net. You know, this is our last program of the year, and I couldn't think of a better way of closing it than with one of the most unusual products and people we've uh, encountered in the years we've been doing this program. Stephen Hollenkamp is founder and CEO of Cocktail Carrier, and this is a product we all have to listen to and to fully understand. Steve, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Don. Well, Steve, as we ask all our guests, before we talk about anything else, tell us a little bit about yourself personally. And you have a very unusual career and uh, uh, location, so just tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, well, um, I grew up in Florida, and realized while I was in while I was in college that the normal path of life wasn't for me. And so when I graduated college I left to Latin America and traveled around for about eight months with a buddy. And then I moved to California to try to be a writer and uh and, and then the writer strike happened in the summer of oh seven and both companies canned me. And then I got a job at Greenpeace and sort of fell in love with that and got passionate and idealistic for a while. Uh, and then I went, I started to, my ideas started to diverge from green pieces, and I went to Korea for a year to teach English. And then I spent a year in Singapore for grad school, and then a year at Columbia for grad school, and that's how I got to New York to start this company. I was working for an investment bank for a few years, not the best at the job, and uh, started dabbling in entrepreneurship and started this company three years ago. And what's the name of your company? The name of the company is Hall Ampersand Camp. Hall and Camp. Uh, Similar to my last name, Hall and Camp. Okay. And so three years ago, what what products did you develop before we get to Cocktail Caviar? You know, I... I developed a few iPhone apps and a children's book. And, you know, I think the the path for a lot of entrepreneurs is building up courage by uh, trying the bigger and more ambitious projects each time. And so um, I see, the, I see my, the apps that I developed as being, you know, in, important steps in me um, learning how to assess whether a business is good or not, uh, and learning how to execute on an idea. Uh, And so, yeah, it was that, and then I had this idea, and it was just the kind of idea that I knew was good enough, and I also knew that I wouldn't be able to do it while working 100-hour weeks at an investment bank. And so the two weeks after I had the idea, I quit my job and left Wall Street and moved to Brooklyn uh, and have been doing this full-time for three years now. Uh, okay, now you have a product called Cocktail Caviar. Tell us about it. Cocktail Caviar is natural, edible pearls infused with flavored vodka. It's little poppable balls filled with vodka, uh, and it's an upscale cocktail garnish. So imagine a pearl in the bottom of a champagne flute that you get on New Year's Eve this year. And that little pearl, it won't dissolve. It just sinks to the bottom and looks pretty at the bottom. And then when you get to the end of your champagne, you get a little 
boozy pop. And that's the product. Yeah, so you get a jar at a liquor store, or you get them in your cocktails at a cocktail bar. It's an upscale cocktail garnish. It's also a food garnish. It's great on desserts and hors d'oeuvres. It's really a, a, an innovative alcohol concept for creative bartenders and home tenders that like entertaining guests with cool uh, little interesting cocktails and desserts and hors d'oeuvres. How did you come up with it? I know you said you uh, you uh, quit your job two weeks, but how did you come up with this? Well, you know, it started, uh, I think it's a, a result of a lot of diverse sort of experiences and ideas. It started, I, I taught English in Korea for a year and fell in love with bubble tea and used to take my students to get bubble tea when we'd finish a test. Uh, I taught at an all-girls middle school. And I loved the idea of bubble tea. You know those little black tapioca squishy pearls in a, in a bubble tea drink? Do you know what that is, Don? Yes. Okay, so I thought that was really cool. I loved the idea of just sort of structurally reimagining what a beverage could be and innovating on a variable other than flavor. And I thought, oh, you know, I'd, I'd love some, for something like this in the cocktail world, uh, but... I didn't like the little squishy balls. I didn't think they'd translate. I didn't think adults would like them. But, I, I, you know, I still like the idea. So it was implanted in my brain. And then a few years prior, I was in Europe, and I learned about this technology called encapsulation. And um, some, some chefs were doing it in Europe, in Germany in the 90s, and then in Spain in the early 2000s. And I thought it was really cool, encapsulating liquid in a little, in a little ball with a thin layer of kelp around it. Um, you really have to see it and taste it to fully get what that means. But I thought, well, what else could we encapsulate? What if we encapsulated motor oil? Could that be cool? Or lubrication? Could that be valuable to a mechanic? And I asked all my engineer friends, what do you think? And they all said, that's a bad idea. And so then, But still, it was implanted in my brain as just like this other cool thing that I had come across. And then I was in Park Slope, Brooklyn in October 2012, and I was with a girl, and she was from New Zealand, and so she was just a little kooky already because uh, she was just different. And it was a date, and it was our second date. And the bar we were at didn't have wine, and she wanted wine. And so she said she was going to leave the bar to go buy wine and sneak it into the bar. And I was just like, no, let's go to another bar. And she said, no, I insist. So I'm alone in this bar for 15 minutes while this girl is going to boot like alcohol into the, trying to boot like alcohol in the bar. And I'm alone. I'm on my second whiskey looking at a candle flickering, thoughts just flickering through your mind the way it does. And then it, it kind of hit me, uh, an alcohol garnish. I kind of combined the ideas and... Uh, was fixated on it, and it ruined the rest of the date. I just wanted to finish this date and get home and start researching the patents. And so she came back, and we, you know, wrapped up the date quickly, and uh, and I went home and, and got started on understanding whether this was possible and uh, putting together a credible supply chain and, and got really excited about it and could no longer work anymore at my job. I just would sit in my cubicle all day thinking about this idea and thinking I need to act now. And so I quit and uh, started the company. Okay, so so where do you manufacture this? And do, do you have patents on, on, on your product? Still patent pending. Um, hopefully we get it. We think we will. But um, So we manufacture mostly in East Asia and, uh, and then a lot in the U.S. for especially smaller, smaller batches. Okay. And now, where do you buy this product? So you would get it in, you know, I, we just launched in Vegas literally this week. Uh, literally 18 pallets of cocktail caviar arrived to Vegas this week, and now we really get to start selling. And, and uh, it's been incredible just the first week being here. This this product was really made for Vegas. Uh, but So you would buy it in uh, a, a cocktail bar your favorite cocktail bar or a restaurant, you'd buy it the way you'd buy any liquor product. 
It's regulated as a liquor product, so you could get it at a liquor store as well. Uh, but you see them on your desserts and in your cocktails at, at bars and restaurants. Are you selling it to the bars to, to resell, or are you selling it to, directly to the people, to consumers? Well, alcohol is strange like that. It's it's a highly regulated industry. It has been since prohibition. So I'm legally not allowed to sell directly to the bar. I'm legally not allowed to sell directly to you, for instance, a customer, if you were a customer. I have to sell to distributors. And so I've partnered with one of the bigger distributors, the biggest in the country, Southern Wine and Spirits. So they're distributing me in Vegas. And then they technically are the ones who sell to the bars and restaurants and nightclubs and lounges and, and liquor stores. Well, are, are you developing a marketing campaign for this? Sort of. Uh, the marketing campaign is is go to the top and uh, go to the top ten players in Vegas and uh, and let them see the potential. Um, and but we're not spending any marketing dollars. All money goes toward sales right now. Well, that's that's smart. Uh, and the reception's been good out in Vegas. It's been incredible, you know. It's uh, it's been the funnest week of of this company is actually having finished jars and walking into accounts and setting it on the table and saying this is a, what I got and then saying we want it and then I say okay, call this number and order it. It's uh, it's the first time I've been able to do that. It's been three years of a theory, of an idea, of a vision. And now that, you know, it took me two years to get spherical alcohol woven into the alcohol laws, two years lobbying uh, the alcohol regulators in D.C. and just fighting to be able to bring this product to life. And uh, then a year of production and raising money and everything. Um, but now that I can actually sell, it's, it's incredible. It's been, it's been really fun. Well, it sounds it sounds that. What have you learned over these three years that you'd pass on to other entrepreneurs? Hmm. I've learned the importance of of having a team of people of advisors. Um, I feel like I've you know I feel like I've learned how to how to solve problems not by sitting there with a pen and paper and thinking about it, but instead thinking, who's the company that could help me solve this? Or who's the person that could help me solve this? Or who do I know that may know how to find a person that could help me solve this problem? You know, um, starting a company is, is so many is so many catch-22s. You know, you want to, you need money to build a product. To develop a product, you need investors to give you the money. You need creative stuff done to get investors and to get distribution. Everything sort of is interdependent. And so solving these little catch-22s uh, requires finding people that know more than you, more than me, and and asking them for help. Um, yeah, it's it's been the cornerstone of this business is just leveraging people much smarter than me to to solve problems and move the company forward. Well, how did you find these people? Well, I live in New York City, or I have for the last five years. And I think, you know, my business philosophy has always been put yourself out there and share your ideas. I think it's it's uh, foolish for a lot of – it's not always foolish, but a lot of times entrepreneurs, they have an idea and they sit on it and they hold on to it. And they're so worried someone's going to steal it that they just sit on and they never do anything with it and they never learn um, was it even a good idea because they never told anyone and they never found a way to make it happen. Um, my philosophy is, you know, Don, it's like, it's like if you could go back to Don in sixth grade, you would tell Don and Don in sixth grade had a crush on a girl. You would tell that Don, go talk to her. And sixth grade Don would say, no, she's going to say no. She may reject me. I'm going to feel terrible. And you'd say, it's not about her now. It's not about getting a girlfriend now. It's about 
building your ability to talk to girls and, and building your confidence. And, and so you can ask a girl out next year and, and then at college, maybe you'll meet a nice girl and you won't be a, a bumbling buffoon because you had been practicing. It's the same thing with ideas. Talk about ideas. And, and learn, everybody's first idea is going to be terrible. Learn why it's not good by telling the world, calling a company that could steal it. And, and maybe they'll email you back, maybe they won't. But, you know, you'll learn that it's hard to have someone steal your idea. You'll also learn that most ideas that you have probably aren't that good. You'll also learn that one of the most important things is execution. That's so, it's so hard to actually execute. Uh, there's so many good ideas out there. Execution is key. Um, but, yeah, you'll learn how to determine what's a, a good idea and a bad idea by getting people's feedback that are smarter than you. And you'll build a network of people that, you know, maybe you can call them in the future and ask, tell them about another idea or get their help on something. And so, you know, it's been, it's been me and my brother, you know, we spent a few years every day t- telling each other our best idea that we had that day. And then we would try to tell a company that could take that idea and make it happen just to learn why it wasn't a good idea. And just the companies would tell us, here's, here's why it's not a good idea. Here's what I would do. And um, we learned an incredible amount doing that. Um, and we built a network of people as well, of contacts and other entrepreneurs. And um, I really leveraged you know, those contacts in that network uh, to build this company. You know, I didn't know how to raise money. I don't know how to build a supply chain. Um, I don't know how to do. I don't know how to find distribution. And um, but yeah, find people that will. And if you're kind and if you're open, I think people are, you know like to help and and will help you. And so yeah, that that at least worked for me. Uh, uh, question for you: How did you come up with the name uh, Liquor Caviar? Cocktail Caviar. Um, well, you know, I wanted something. It's a novel product, I, and so I wanted uh, a a name. I wanted words that people that were accessible to people. Cocktail, you know what that is. Caviar, you know what that is. Uh, and so there's some sort of, you know, way for you to step into the product because you get what the words are. You don't exactly know it's spherical alcohol, but you'll never fully get that because you've never seen it before. So there's always going to be that learning curve. And also, the regulators, you know, it's a low-proof product. It's only 25 proof. It's meant to taste good and sort of dress up your drinks and cocktails and hors d'oeuvres. It's not meant to get you sloppy drunk necessarily, although it will. Uh, But, you know, I didn't, I was worried that children might see the product on their parents, you know, in their parents' liquor cabinet and think it's candy or something. And I wanted to do the best that I can to try to, prevent that. I didn't want a vulgar name or a booze balls kind of name and a you know a, a childlike uh label. So I chose the word uh, caviar in the title. Kids don't like caviar. So uh it might deter them. So um that was important to me. Um yeah and cut for caviar I think it sounds nice. Do you do you have a website, Stephen? Cocktailcaviar dot com. Uh. Just like it sounds, cocktailcaviar.com, huh? Just like it sounds, and that's right. What's your, what's your plan for expansion after Las Vegas? We're going to be here for a few months. The, the strategy is make this Vegas make Vegas work and find a workable model, find a workable sales model. It's a, it's a product that everybody loves, but no, it's never been done before. It's never, I have no comparison, so... We have to learn a lot about the way bars and restaurants are using it and, and what they want out of it and and um, develop basically a playbook that can be expanded. So we'll be here for a few months figuring that out, making Vegas work. Then my home market is New York. I've been building up for several years. Um, so I have a plethora of interested accounts, and, and I've been doing events there for years. So, um, yeah, then New York – and then L.A. and Miami. Florida's my home state, so uh, I can't wait to go to Florida. But uh, Florida, Miami, and New York are the next three. And, um, you know, the vision is Cocktail Caviar is a national accounts product. That means national accounts being restaurant groups, hotel groups, 
um, that are across the U.S. Um, you know, to, uh, 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 cruise lines, airlines, and um, and so I've partnered with the biggest distributor in the country, and uh, they're interested in you know having cocktail caviar in their tool belt to solve the problems of their national account customers. So to do that, we'd have to be national. So uh, I hope we'll be national in a few years, and then. Yeah, who knows? Globally, I think there's a lot of opportunity to sell cocktail caviar in Europe and in Korea and Japan and Hong Kong, Singapore. There's a big cocktail market. Um, but first things first, we got a good, pro- we have a great product, good margins, good distribution strategy, and the money to make it happen. So let's make it happen in Vegas, and then all else will flow from there. Well, uh, will people? I go into a bar and order a cocktail. And they put your your, your ca- cocktail caviar in there. Do they charge me extra for it? Maybe, uh, or it, you know, a lot of places that we cater to are places that sell expensive cocktails or re- relatively high quality cocktails with a high quality price. And you don't want to get you don't want to be upsold on a you know fourteen to twenty dollar cocktail. Uh, you're paying a good amount for a cocktail. You want it to be a great cocktail. So places in Vegas, they are, they say, we make our cocktails better, and maybe we can charge more, but we're not going to upsell you. You pay one fee, um, or maybe we don't increase the price. We just make the cocktail more interesting and better and a better experience. So then you order more cocktails, or you, you're having more fun and you stay longer at that bar. Um, or... Um, or, yeah, maybe instead of getting a beer, you get a cocktail because you saw the waitress walk by and there was this interesting thing and with this, these pearls inside and you got to have it. So it really adds to the uh, presentation of the cocktail as well. Yeah, yeah, it's visual. You know, how many how many cocktails could you see and you'd know what product's inside, you know? You, it's just liquid with the color. Uh, but with some pearls inside, now there's dimensionality, and there's something, you know, something innovative beyond flavor. Something that you can say, I've never seen that, and I came to Vegas for those for that experience. Let me have one of those. Yes, uh, Vegas is the right place to launch this. If nothing else, you have a lot of people coming from different parts of the country. Right, right. It's a, it's a good national sales strategy, too, um, having people across the country come here, see a product, and go back to their hometown, wherever it is, and, and, and say, I want to have that cocktail caviar. Where's that? And then they go to their local liquor store or, or tell their favorite, you know, their local bartender about it. Well, in this case, you hope that what stays in, in what happens in Las Vegas does not stay there. That is a good line. Yeah, exactly. You know, Steve, you're you're one of the unique people we've had on the program with a unique product and a unique um, marketing strategy. And we're so glad you joined us tonight. Thank you for having me. This is my, you know, one of my first interviews. So this is this is great for me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to to talk to you and, yeah, and practice this. So, uh, again, your w- website again, and spell it out for our audience. Cocktailcaviar.com, and it's a, right now it's a placeholder page where we, we just redid the site, so that will go live in another few weeks. Um, but if you there's an email address on there, so if anyone would like some info, shoot me an email and I'll send you a sell sheet. And, yeah, I'm happy to talk to Anyone interested in and in learning more about what we're what we're doing and what we're building? Well, well very definitely. Uh, I myself, I don't drink, but uh, I definitely want to see your product. Uh, All right. So we'll hopefully, I don't have to, to go out to Las Vegas. Off. I'm sorry. You'll be we'll be just in Vegas, but within another month, you'll be able to buy it online and in most states. Uh, in 30-something U.S. states. So people can buy it and have it for their, you know, maybe not for Christmas or New Year's, but for Valentine's Day or, uh, yeah, their next their next party. 
Well, uh, well, good luck to you, Steve. We're going to have you back on the program later on next year. Tell us how things worked out. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Thank you, Don. It was a pleasure.